So um, welcome everyone to um, WGS 391, uh, Methods and Scholarship in Women's and Gender Studies. And um, we're very, very honored and excited to have Dr. Heather Montes Ireland, who's a professor in Women's and Gender Studies here at DePaul, with us today to talk about her scholarship. And I just wanna mention for those of you who um, may be listening to this, but not in the class, we've had the great opportunity to read her article, Noble Mothers and Their Others, Racialized Women Entrepreneurs and Poverty Finance, that was published in the Journal of International Women's Studies in July of 2022. So if we could all, in however that you can, please welcome Dr. Heather Montes Ireland. Oh. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. Thank you, Professor Russo. It's so nice to be here with you all. Really, this is exciting. It's exciting to be able to talk about methods. <laughs> no, really, it is very exciting to be able to talk about, you know, your work and um, and to talk with interested folks who are doing some similar things, right? We're all working on um, various writing projects, <laughs> research projects, right? And so when you are doing that and you spend so much work and time and energy and you give so much to the project, you feel like it really is, you just want it to be shared. <laughs> you know, you wanna share with others and, and you wanna, you want them to read it, you know? So I'm so happy to have this opportunity with you all. Um, anything else, Dr. Russo, before do you want me to just dive in? I think you were, okay, you muted, so. Yeah, no, just go ahead and dive in. We're, um, we're okay. just love to hear what you have to say. And then we'll open it up for questions and conversation. Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. Yes, yeah, so hello everyone. I do know a lot of you and I look forward to getting to know more of you who I don't know yet. Um, but uh, it's just really great to be with you all today. Um, I have in the past taught 391, I will say. And so I'm just also so appreciative of Dr. Russo teaching this class. Um, and that has given me an opportunity also to develop a course that I'm working on for next quarter, which is Latina Feminist Thought and Culture, which I will be offering in the spring and um, to do something else. So I will say this class, this is a really hard class, I think both for students and um, their professors, because we only have 10 weeks together. Right. And, and there is so much to learn and so much to to discuss under the rubric of feminist methods and scholarship. It is, it fills entire years of your lives as it has already, right? You've been spending years, you know, even just at DePaul, um, getting to this point. And so the first thing I wanted to say was that I'll talk, to, I'll tell you a little bit about what I hope to um, share with you today. But I also want for some of my comments today to be pragmatic um, uh, offerings <laughs> to you. You're probably getting lots of different types of advice, but just pragmatic offerings to you about approaching, you know, this quarter and next. And so one of those things for me is to not forget that you have been spending the last however many years developing your tool, you know, your, your toolkit or your tools that you are drawing from for this class. So you're not starting over, <laughs> you know, you're not starting from scratch. And I want you to keep that in mind. That is so important as you're thinking about your own methods and the theories that inform what, you know, what you wanna look at and the ways you want to intervene with your projects. Um, and then you also have been exposed to so many just theoretical approaches, right? And so think about the things that animate you, you know, the interventions you wanna make and start there um, because I think that can be really helpful 
to guide you. You know, uh, we were just chatting a minute ago about what sustains us. And I think one thing for sure when you are entering into any research project is to make sure it's something you want to think about for a while, <laughs> you know, that you're not going to get tired of and that it's something you feel um, various forms of connection to. So trying to let go a little bit of what you think you should do and really try to connect with what animates you. What do you love to think about? Um, and that has been something for me that has really guided so much of my own work, <clears throat> especially when I'll give you an example, <laughs> I write about things like mm, entrepreneurship um, in this field, right? Of women's and gender studies, people are like, what in the heck? Why would you be interested in that? I, I spend a lot of time in my under, um, let me think when was, oh, graduate school, like my master's degree program and my doctorate program in the beginning, convincing people of why I should be writing about this. And so I would like to encourage you all as well to consider this quarter and next as, you know, our within the context of the experimental time that it is, okay? You get to think and write about things that you have been wanting to think and write about for four years or three years, you know, if you've been doing this since um, the beginning. Um, and, and so rather than thinking it has to be right or perfect, really approaching it with that spirit of curiosity and creativity. Um, that is something that has helped me so much in my own work. It also helps to fend off the mental chatter, the doubt, the questions of who am I to say this? <laughs> who am I to write this thing? And etc. Okay, so I will come back to that because I want to talk with you all today about um, methods um, in scholarship itself and some of my methodological approaches as well as methods of writing, right? So I definitely think about methods of researching and methods of writing as both linked, but they are also different, different things as well, which I will give you some examples of. So first I'll start by thinking with you all about methods of research, okay? And um, that is why I sent you um, Sheila Sandoval's, uh, a piece from Sheila Sandoval's um, really foundational manuscript. Some of you can see I'm holding this. This is the larger book, um, Methodology of the Oppressed. Um, and the subtitle is I think theory out of bounds, or maybe that's just, I can't remember. Oh, I think that's maybe where it was published was in, um, was in a series of works about theory out of bounds. And so I really like that idea, okay, of theory out of bounds. And that that is something that informs like the way I think about my own methods. Um, Indeed, okay, so many of you know or have heard of the term like interdisciplinary, right? That we are in this field, we are an interdisciplinary field in women's and gender studies. But what that means, you know, I think is very contested. <laughs> um, and when you are a student of women's and gender studies, particularly when you are someone like who is majoring in this field, right? Um, it really will behoove you to think a lot about what that means to you. What does it mean to have an interdisciplinary approach to your research? Um, and so this has been something I've been thinking about for many, many years. And maybe from the article that I wrote from Noble Mothers, you might see some of that, what I think of as an interdisciplinary method coming through. Right, so in this article, I am examining 
really in some ways the narrative rhetoric or the narrative discourse of microfinance. Okay, I'm gonna just, I don't know if everyone can see this, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna type this here. Um, there we go, and larger, yeah. So some of, some of it is like, a, oh, I'm sorry, a narrative rhetoric, sorry, let me write both of these. I meant to say both. A narrative rhetoric and a visual rhetoric, sorry, of microfinance, okay? And so when I was approaching um, this article and beginning to write an article, which now this article is also really informative of the larger, like the book project that I'm working on at this time. Um, this article came because I had questions. Okay, and so I want you all to think about that too, but I had questions about particularly things like um, economic justice. I had questions about welfare rights. Um, I had questions about work and labor politics. And I really had questions about why, right, in my view, as I kept thinking and thinking about it, I couldn't understand why um, particularly uh, poor women in the US and especially US women of color were represented and discussed so differently from poor women outside of the US when it comes to poverty alleviation policy. Okay. So I kept saying to myself, wait, I, I, don't, I don't understand. Why is it that US women of color and other poor and um, working poor women are so denigrated in the US, are called things like welfare queens, um, I, dropping anchor babies, right? Like the ways that um, these narratives of immigration from our Southern border are so deeply gendered. Um, I grew up always hearing that like Puerto Ricans, right? So um, I'm a diasporic Puerto Rican, like Cali Rican. I grew up in the West Coast. But I remember always growing up hearing that Puerto Ricans come to the US to take welfare. And, and this was a bad thing, <laughs> whatever. And, um, and that meant that you were a bad person. But then when I saw the ways that microfinance, if you all are familiar now with the article, you, you understand more of, of what it is. But microfinance, right, was a poverty alleviation tool that began to get major traction um, in the US uh, starting um, around the late 90s and 2000. I, uh, I'm gonna put in a pin in that comment that I was almost gonna say for a minute, but I was like, wait, okay. So within the microfinance world, of poverty alleviation, there were so many, as I say in my article, like right, smiling women of color. And the, the woman of color was this figure of being seen as like someone really worthy of help. She's a hard worker. She is clearly innovative and resourceful. She just needs a helping hand. But in the US, it couldn't be more starkly different. Right. She is someone who is trying to take. She's a drain on society. She's a baby maker, uh, lascivious sexuality, um, lazy. Right. Right. So thinking about these tropes just on and on and on. And I kept thinking, but if that same woman was to cross U.S. borders, how does she go from that hardworking, worthy of respect person to someone who is then denigrated? Okay. So. The question for me, right? That was like so important to me. And I, I wanted to explore that. Okay. Then I began to understand and trace the ways in which um, poverty policy, like around microfinance began to come up and really gain traction at the same time that we were seeing uh, welfare being dismantled in the US, right? So we are currently now at 25 years anniversary from the um, Pawora, uh, P-R-W-O-R-A, 
the policy that um, basically dismantled welfare in the US. Um, that was 25 years ago, uh, this, August, this past August, August 20, uh, 2021. And in that time, we have really seen um, the rise of economic inequities. We have seen the rise in, um, uh, yes, housing bodies, particularly women, poor women, women of color in uh, the penal system, right? So we've seen all of these things happening at the same time. And when you have these big questions, right, especially in this field, it's like, well, how do I even begin? How do I even start to get at? a thread of this so that I can, can create a, a research project that might help to explain and understand and maybe seek something else, something different. And so back to the question about interdisciplinary methods, I was taught um, early on in my, you know, I've been uh, trained as an interdisciplinary in my whole career. So so like many of you, like I have been a women's and gender studies student from pretty much the very beginning, but from my time when I was at Cal State University Long Beach, I was a women's and gender studies student. So I wasn't taking like methods, like a methods class about how to do qualitative interviewing, semi-formal or structured, <laughs> you know, I wasn't taking classes on auto ethnographic or, you know, field ethnographies. I mean, I've right? I wasn't exposed to those things. I wasn't exposed to historical methods, which many people would uh, have as a historian. What I was exposed to, though, was, I think, two main things. One was the, the ways that my classes, my faculty, um, the works I was reading were all clearly demonstrating to me that you could approach these questions from different fields, right? And that different fields, will, you know, different approaches will give you different answers. That was really important, y'all. And it is so important. I can't, I know that you're like, well, right. Isn't that like, of course, isn't that obvious? But you know, what's interesting, it isn't obvious to everyone. Because if you've only been trained like in one way of thinking, right? Then let's say you're just a historian, then you're thinking there's only one way to answer these questions. And I know one way to do it, okay? And that way that you know how to answer questions, folks, is going to be that it's going to, in some ways, delimit, right? Delimit even what you can ask. So I want you to think, folks, about the ways in which WGS and interdisciplinarity, understanding these big issues from all of these various entry points is really um, such a robust way of thinking. It really gives you so much to work with, okay? It is not a lack. It is not less than. It is really um, actually a powerful tool. So now to put this in very specific terms, right? Um, so that was number one, um, you know, for me. And so in specific terms, I realized I could approach issues of like political economy and policy from that interdisciplinary disciplinary perspective, including some reading practices from the humanities, from uh, literature and cultural studies and um, yeah, I mean, even that I'm not a big, I'm not like a literary critic by any means, <laughs> but I knew that there were practices of reading, of, of looking, of researching that came from that, those fields that were helpful to me to apply to a very different field. I did not want to approach the questions I had, and I didn't even think they were, they were questions that could be answered by merely, let's say, heterodox economic theory, okay? Because economists have lots to say about <laughs> these things, um, and they often leave out, um, or they're deeply sexist theories, um, and they leave out, you know, so much of what we consider to be, right, issues of power um, and domination in society. So I couldn't approach my questions just through economics, okay? And the second thing 
that I realized as a student like yourselves was that like because <laughs> um right so like when I saw that these questions could be answered through different you know, arenas through different ways of thinking. And then the second thing I saw was that because I knew that and that was demonstrated to me, I was, it was almost like, well, of course, of course, that in women's and gender studies, we have the tools, we have the, the frames of analysis to ask and answer these really huge, important questions. Okay, of course. I was like, how else can you do it? You know, that's especially when I was a, an undergraduate. I'm like, what? how else can you think about these big problems in society or things that let's be real often seem so big if you're not thinking about it interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarily and intersectionally, you know, through women's and gender studies frames. So that is where I'm saying that when I came to my project then, I was like, oh yeah, Shayla Sandoval, right? Shayla Sandoval, she's talking about semiotics. What in the heck is that, you know? And as I was reading her work, I realized that so much of it resonated with the ways that I think about my own method and methodologies, okay? And the hardest part, I think for me, where did these notes go? Y'all, I had some notes for you. There it is. Um, the hardest part was actually naming it, really, or, or being able to explain why I use the methods I do. Okay. So, um, right. So first, before I say that, I'll say one more time, like what I don't do, right? I am someone who is interested in finance. I'm interested in like racial capitalism, economic justice, policy, welfare rights, labor rights transformative intersectional labor movements, um, well, sexual moral panics, you know, so the ways even that so much about sexual regulation is embedded in these, in these conversations around policy and, and things like that. Okay, so those are the things I'm interested in. People often are like, oh, so of course you're like an economist. Okay, but I, I'm not. <laughs> and I am interested in economics, though, right? And so I was starting to look at things like feminist um, heterodox economics, they call it, right? So not the, the orthodoxy in, that you would learn if you were an economics student today in the classroom. So I don't do that. I don't do hetero, I don't do orthodox economics, okay? Like, I know that. And I'm not a historian. <laughs> All right, so sometimes, and why do I say this, right? Sometimes you have to know what it is you're not interested in. You're like, okay, you know, I'm interested in this question, but I don't think, <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm interested in thinking about it the way that economists do, because I'll tell you what, round and round they go, and their concerns are usually not my concerns, you know, as a, as a women's and gender studies researcher. Okay, so what really stood out to me here was some of my notes. I'm like, I can't forget to say some things about Sandoval's work. When I first encountered Sandoval and this idea of like the methodology of the oppressed, um, first of all, this, the book itself um, came from, it, it sort of emerged from her essay that she had published, um, geez, I'm not even sure exactly when that was, but it was probably Dr. Russo like knows this, but it was such an important time, an important time that um, Ann Russo was involved with too, like as scholars in this field were thinking about um, what, you know, where the field was going and really acknowledging some of the, the down, the pitfalls and where it had been, as well as the potentiality. And so the essay that Sandoval wrote was called US Third World Feminism, the Theory and Method of Oppositional Consciousness in the Postmodern World. So, um, okay. Um, and in that essay, and more broadly in this piece, I think you all might have noticed too, just as an overarching thing that she's doing, 
Um, in that essay, she argued for, as Davis says, an emancipatory potential in women of color formations and strategies rather than neoliberal conceptions of diversity, for instance, right? She was not interested in that so much as she was interested in completely transforming um, even, you know, the very questions we ask, I think. So part of my methodology, folks, right, is I start with thinking about the questions that, you know, women of color feminist formations make possible. Um, transnational feminists, like it was so interesting to me as I would read work by, you know, Chandra Talpid Mohanty, that Mohanty was bringing this, what she called an anti-capitalist critique to the work. And that was different than what even like feminist economists were doing or socialist feminists necessarily. Okay. So the reason I bring this up is right, so many things can be influencing your methodology, the theoretical base that you have that is robust and, uh, and is wonderful. So the hardest part sometimes is corralling that, you know, and saying, well, then what is like my method? Um, so in that piece that you all read, Noble Mothers, yes, I think that's what I what we started to realize is that it was a narrative and visual, it was narrative and visual rhetoric um, analysis. But really, I think too, I was also informed by Hill Collins chapter um, from Black Feminist Thought on controlling images as well. So, right, so it's not just on the wall, I was like, oh my God, yeah. You know, what are the ways that these, um, that, that images are, um, yeah. So like what I'll tell you in a second, what Sandoval calls semiotics, what are the ways that images and tropes and um, symbols and signs and stereotypes, like how do they actually operate to control? Indeed, folks, one of the things that I realized through my own work and that I started to be really interested in is like, what do they say in political science? Uh, something about perception. Perception is reality or whatever. Perception, uh, politics is perception, I think they often say, which is that how people perceive issues, social problems, who is a social problem, that is all influenced by, you know, how we think about things. If we can change how we think about something, we can achieve completely different goals, we can ask completely different questions. But if you can't even imagine a question beyond like how it is being thought about in the mainstream, then you're never going to get to, to, you know, something else. And for me, that something else is right. For many of us, it's, it's justice, you know, it's, it's equity, um, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so one more thing, and then please, anyone, like if you want to drop things in the chat or whatever, I'm so happy to hear it. Um, but I'm trying to see exactly which piece here, like where there is a, that I could share a particular line from this article of Sandoval's. But um, I want to make one comment before I do, which is that um, there are also two things that Sandoval does in this work that I think are so influential to me. One is the study of semiotics. So it's like, what is semiotics, right? And for her too, and many people, but especially for Sandoval, it is this idea of the study of, um, of signs and symbols, okay? And, and the ways that we make meaning of you know, socially make meaning of signs and symbols, but, you know, and not like a stop sign, right? Although that could also be maybe conceived of as semiotics, like it's a red octagon and then it only is given meaning because we as a society say, you must stop when you see that image at the side of the road. Um, but she takes it, um, you know, much further beyond that kind of thing, okay? So semiotics. And I really was compelled by that idea. And then also cultural studies, um, which is also so really important to me. And I believe now I, I think about my work 
as being a cultural studies um, method, right? So that it draws a lot from the humanities um, and thinking about culture. And I mean, by culture, I mean folks like visual culture, film, you know, cultural production that, that folks engage in. And of course, that's not necessarily represented at all in the article you read, right? But that is part of like what I'm doing. So like in my larger book project that comes up more. Um, yes. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I think I'll stop there for now, for a minute. <laughs> because I feel like, yeah. Yeah, I'm, uh, hopefully I'm giving you some things to consider and then I don't wanna have it be, you know, over, mm, over communicated but maybe there are some questions coming up for you as well. And I wanna to attend to those. But the other thing, remember I said too, is we could talk at least briefly about, so methods of research are one thing, but we could also talk about methods of writing. Linked, but not, not necessarily the same. Um, yes, Liv, I, Hola, Liv. I do see. Okay. So there is a question right here in the chat and Liv is saying, oh my gosh, yes. Hmm. So good, Liv. Why are you drawn to the study of mothers and domestic thinking about like domestic as care work? Why do you think it's important that feminist scholars include these communities in our scholarship? Well, um, thank you oh, for that great question. I do have to start with a funny anecdote. I don't know if I've told any of you this of who I've worked with before, but I might have told Anne Russo um, that one time a few years back when I was interviewing for jobs, <laughs> I had given a talk, um, actually a talk that was very much linked to this article that you all read. And um, <clears throat> one of the people who would have been my colleagues was like, so didn't ask this question at all, like beautifully, like Liv has done was like, um, very disdainful, like, so what's, what's your deal with mothers? I was like, oh, I tell you what, um, okay, that question is one of the reasons that I, I'm drawn to um, mother work and, and thinking about um, the role of mothers, mothering care work more broadly. Um, but a lot of, you know, the questions that I would get that were sort of disdainful about why you would study mothers um, really spoke to two things. One was the fact that they're not reading the work of feminists of color. <laughs> you know, they haven't been reading the work of like Latina uh, Chicana theorists who have been talking about, you know, La Virgen de Guadalupe and these images and the iconography of womanhood um, in particular and the ways that it would um, uh, operate for social control. Okay, so Liv, this has like kind of a two-part answer. One is that I was reading the work of, of feminists of color who kept coming back and saying like, we can't not attend to this image of the mother. I'm not a biological mother myself, right? But everything we think about for in terms of like womanhood in our society, and I think transnationally is so linked it's so deeply heteronormative, first of all, but so deeply linked to this idea of woman as mother that they're almost, it's often difficult for people to, to think them outside of each other. So that's one thing. Um, and yeah, like I think about Chicana Latina feminists early on that were talking about this. Um, yeah, and especially lesbian, right? Lesbian um, Chicana feminists, they were like, okay. Like, or then we can't think of the idea, like the term lesbian and mother together, right? Like these were things that scholars were writing about. But more importantly to live, um, right? These were questions for me of, of, yeah, I don't know, racial capitalism, right? And the, and the places that racial capitalism was structuring that we are either inclined to not think about or are encouraged to not think about. And so um, 
to me, I was like, well, that's so insidious, right? That racial capitalism is framing sometimes what we think of as like the most intimate places of our lives, um, care, right? Relationships to people that we, we care and love. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I could say more about that. But the second question too, that it's important, um, you know, within every field, there are different um, terms sometimes that will preoccupy a field for a while. And um, there was a point, whether this is fair or not of me, but there was a point when I felt like when I was in graduate school that I felt that too many of the things I was reading that we had, we had lost, um, right, like I said, this isn't necessarily fair, okay? I'm just gonna tell you how I was thinking. Like, I felt like we had lost that, that kind of material and materialist analysis of, um, of the lives of multiply marginalized people. And that I felt, again, I think maybe this is more, I felt that this is the place to do that work here. Like in women's and gender studies, sexuality studies, queer studies, critical ethnic studies, this is the place to do that work. You know, sure, they can do it in labor studies too, but here we are equipped um, with these frames of analysis. Um, and at the end of the day, live, yeah, so important because, you know, um, we, can't for, we can't leave folks behind, okay, that are doing the care work. They're the ones who are really deep, you know, who are so marginalized in many ways, but are also not like thought of as the cool or like edgy folks that it's like sexy to think about them, right? And during Occupy Wall Street, same thing, right? Occupy Wall Street, so interesting, really interesting movement. But I was like, where are the mothers? You know, it'd be really hard for a woman of color to take her child, especially if she's a, if she's a lone mother, to take her child and sleep out on the street. Um, because of the regulation, like the social regulation of how people think about um, the mother work of women of color generally. So I was like, what would that movement have looked like if mothers of color, particularly poor mothers of color had been central to the organizing and the strategizing, right? So anyway, thank you so much, Liv. I could go on and on, but um, yeah. So Aviv, in relation to this quote from Sandoval, my method is not fixed. It is based on what I read, how it affects me. That is on the surprise that comes from reading something that compels you to read differently. I therefore have no method since every work <laughs> suggests a new approach. Has your method evolved, shifted, changed over time and how has that shifted? Yeah. Ah, oh. love that quote so much. And I when I was thinking about coming to meet with you all today, I'm like, this is probably one of the hardest things to teach about feminist methods is when we, you, we want to teach students, like we want you to have the practical tools and skills to be able to craft and especially to craft a logistical project that you can get done in the amount of time you have. Okay. That's really important. Okay. It has to be doable. But Yes, what I now think about that Sandoval um, says there is that she's really talking about an anti-disciplinary method. You know, the other person that talks about this or maybe who even framed it that way, maybe for me in the first time is, is um, Richa Nagar. She talks about right, like having this anti-disciplinary method. Professor Russo knows like what I'm talking about. And, and like you see that come up in Santin in, in her playing with fire and working with Santin writers. So sometimes though, it's hard to have an anti-disciplinary method when you are situated, like, let's say y'all like, okay, I got to get a grade in this class and graduate. <laughs> okay. So it's like, how do we do that? Um, in ways that are legible, you know, that we can create work that's legible. So yes, Aviv, my method has evolved, shifted and changed in some ways. Like I'm still doing a lot of the things I was doing from the beginning, but one of the ways they've evolved is that I, I'm able to look at the precedent for what I'm doing, like Sandoval and others and, 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 and I can, so if even the way I think about them is different, then it has evolved. Right. If I'm like, yes, of course, because we're no longer talking just about like 
postmodern analysis like Sandoval was at the time. That was a really interesting moment. It informs so much of like we're thinking what we think about today, you know, in this field. But now that we're in this um, moment of like deep, 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 and, and a, a sort of profound way that neoliberalism has completely altered everything about society, ourselves, our relationships to one another, our ability to recover from a global pandemic. Like it has altered everything. So then I have shifted to, does that make sense? Um, and yes, I hope that you also are going to continue shifting and evolving as a writer and a thinker, you know, and that we don't let our concerns about like, am I saying this right? Stop us from saying something because you know, at the end of the day, it's like, we have to say it because of course we want to engender a conversation or we want to be part of the conversation. And then of course it should evolve from there as well. So yes, it'd be like, we should be evolving. The scholarship is evolving. Our methods are going to evolve, but sometimes it can even be just these slight ways of how we think about what we do. Um, thank you so much again for these, wow, such thoughtful questions. Um, and please come back in too if you have a follow-up. But Liza, so how does your method of a, as a researcher influence or differ from your method as a professor teacher? Ah, oh, this is so, 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 so good, y'all. These are amazing questions. Do you see? Y'all are already thinking about these things in such thoughtful ways, such complex ways. Um, for me, and it's actually part of my job to express how my research and the methods I use there influence my work in the classroom and my pedagogies and my methodological approaches there. Um, and, um, and so one of those is that I'm, I'm always, I'm very interested in two things. One, I obviously want to be talking with students all the time about like capitalism, racial capitalism, you know, sometimes not even just, okay, this week we're talking about capitalism, but just how it's embedded, you know, in so many things, colonialism, uh, you know, I always want to start there with students. And so there are certain methods that influence the way that I even think about a syllabus, right? The politics of citationality, who's included, what, what are we, <clears throat> what are we talking about, you know, and who's part of that conversation in this class? But then it can also impact how I work with students. And yes, you know, I think a lot about the mind, body, spirit connection. Um, sometimes students reject that. Lately, students have not been rejected. During this pandemic, students have been there for it because, you know, we're talking about what it's like to be human beings or, you know, theory out of bounds, right? Um, what, is, what else does some of us say about that too? That it's like, Oh, I remember Davis said of Sandoval's work in, in her foreword, which I don't think you all have, but Davis said that, what is it here? Oh, yes. Sandoval's work subverts the idea of the social passivity of theory. It subverts the idea of the social passivity of theory. And so like I bring that into my teaching, right? Because I'm thinking, of course, like what we do in this classroom matters. It isn't just an intellectual project. It's important that, you know, we're here together and that we can learn together and we understand this, but it's not just an intellectual project. And vice versa. Yeah, y'all working with you all, talking about these things, being able to express them. Um, so having our pedagogy influence the work um, is hugely important because being able to express things to all, you know, it's like, what if you have all these ideas, ideas, but you can't express them to others? And that is really hard. And so teaching um, uh, really reminds me of that, of like, how can we express um, the really important things? How can I bring economic justice, class literacy, for instance, like, bring conversations about welfare rights into my classes, um, labor justice, like bringing that in all the time too. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you everyone so much. So I have another question then. And yeah, let's talk about methods of writing for real quick. How are y'all doing out there? <laughs> oh my God, I'm just talking and talking and talking at you. Yeah, thank you. Because I'm like, oh, let's take, let's take a breath. 
you know. Okay, good. Thank you so much, y'all. Thank you. That's so, uh, so encouraging because I don't want to, you know, just talk at you and talk to you, but um, it's so, it's so exciting to talk with you all about this. Um, okay, so the first question is, let, let me just say a couple things about methods of writing. So methods of research, like, ooh, we could sit here all day and we could be thinking about various things. Like right now, one more thing to your question too, Lisa, is I'm working on this paper about Boricua feminisms. And then I'm like bringing that into this Latina feminist thought and culture class next quarter. And I'm like, oh, it's amazing when you can get the like synchronicity. So we'll see, we'll see how it goes. We'll see if I'm able to, <laughs> to convey that to students next quarter, right? Like what Boricua feminisms is and what it does. And um, by the way, folks, Boricua being a term is like a politically conscious term that connects um, Puerto Rican people to um, our you know, indigenous roots on the island. So um, Boricua is Puerto Rican. But so anyway, whole other thing. Yeah, come, come join the class. I'd love to talk to you all about that more next quarter. Um, but it is on my mind to your question, uh, Liza. That's so good. Okay, so methods of writing. So writing, you know, when you actually did, so you've been doing this research, you're taking notes, you've got these ideas pop in, you know, and then you're like, you go to sit and you're just like, oh, shit. <laughs> what was I thinking? Some of you don't have that problem. You are lucky devils, because some of us really struggle to just start to get those words on the page. If you are someone that's a prolific writer, beautiful, 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 go with it. You don't even have to listen to what I'm saying right now. Um, but if you are someone like me, where when you sit down and you want to say the things that are on your mind, that it can be hard for you, then right, then we're dealing with, in some ways, the uh, pragmatic nature of what it means to sit down and approach your writing practice through methods. Um, and so for me, one of the things that is really helpful is to know what works for you pragmatically. Like I use this, okay, I don't use this um, necessarily only to teach classes. I use these things all the time. Okay, what am I saying? earbuds. Okay. Why? Because what I do is when I open my computer, I like to put the earbuds in. Okay. Like, or headphones, whatever you would all do and put on a particular soundtrack, a particular soundtrack y'all that helps me really focus and write. That is a method of writing. So methods of writing are so amazing really, because you can figure out what works for you. You can try different things. And if you're someone like me who can get a little bit like the attention, I mean, I really struggle with attention. Um, but then once I get in, anyone who has a little attention disorder knows once you get into the zone, you can be like so um, focused. So, um, so some of them are just really practical things like that. What works for you to write? I like to put a timer on. I like to use the Pomodoro technique. Um, I'm sure some of you have thought or heard of this before. If you haven't, it was a lifesaver for me in graduate school. Um, when I don't use it, like if there are days when I don't use it, I'm like, why didn't I do that? I, I, this is why I, you know, didn't get as much writing done today or whatever. Um, so I like to put on a timer. I like to put in my earbuds. I put on the same soundtrack and I go into the work. Um, the other thing that I like to do, um, as a, especially as a student, is that I use affirmations. Mm -hmm. So when I was writing my dissertation, I would pull three cards every day from this. this I, I love these particular cards that I use. I'd be happy to share them with people. But um, I would pull three cards before I would write. And it was odd, but the things would come up so similarly every time. And usually it was, you are safe. You are held by the universe, you know, stuff that I really needed to hear about my writing because I felt really vulnerable. And I often felt very scared to say the things that I needed to say or write because also of how, you know, I was raised and socialized like Cayadita, like you, you, talk too much, you know, you should be quiet, that kind of thing. Um, 
or no one like wants to hear what you have to say, okay, which can be a really, you know, very gendered, but also like a really racialized gendered thing. So that's what I mean about methods of writing. What actually do you want to bring in the tangible things that you want to bring in to your space to, to best support your writing practice? Okay. So simple and straightforward. And what's amazing about methods of writing is that they can be so pragmatic. <laughs> You're like, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to open the screen. I'm going to walk away. I'm going to let the, the document boot up, you know, and then I'm going to come sit down and I'm going to bring my tea and then I'm going to start, you know, I mean, it can literally be that simple. Okay. Um, I have many more suggestions, but for now. Do you hear what I'm saying? So methods can be really complex, but methods of writing, you can set yourself up to succeed y'all. So I encourage you to experiment with those things. I love to read a lot about writers, what they do, you know, cause I'm like, oh, I'm a writer. That's right, I am a writer. But I like to read a lot um, of my favorite writers in the world who are typically fiction writers. I love to read about their processes. Y'all know Colson, Colson Whitehead? Oh, God, I love Colson Whitehead and Louise Erdrich. So Colson Whitehead, um, who just wrote his most recent novel is Harlem Shuffle. And he's one of like the most prolific, you know, writers of our time. Like, I love him. And he says he leaves like his writing processes. He says, I, I write five days a week. I oh, know. What did he say? Yeah. Five days a week, leaving one day for my own neuroses. Okay. So when I'm like, yes, Colson Whitehead, who's so amazing, is neurotic about his writing process. Yeah, that helps me. Okay, last thing here. Um, what are the avenues for collaboration that you create in your work? How do you manage or coordinate collaboration in your methodology and writing process given research is often tied to the personal? How do you grapple with divorcing ownership on projects research given we spend such intimate time with it or do you? Mm. Aww. So beautiful. Um, start with the last one. Sometimes divorcing ownership is the only way to maintain your sense of self um, in the process of writing because the other aspect of writing is that we have to, it gets critiqued. Okay, it does, it gets critiqued. That is part of it. That's something I grappled with so much as a student. I was like, but this is so important to me. I, I don't want uh, to hear that it sucks or something. <laughs> um, and so I really had to do a lot of work. Um, and some of it is, yes, like, you know, this is so important to me. It is sometimes my baby. I do feel like I am, you know, I'm birthing in a particular way on um, these ideas, but they're always, um, you know, they've been influenced by so many different people and so many different um, folks that I'm so grateful to, even folks I'll never meet, you know, who I've read their work. So one of the things I think about in terms of collaboration, though I don't do a lot of collaborative work in my, uh, my own research because it's like my process is so slow and methodical, um, but I think about it that I'm entering a conversation so feminist work to me is always collaborative because I am like um, thinking about who I'm reading, you know, who I'm citing. I'm looking to, you know, what are folks doing? What, you know, having conversations with other people about the work. Mm, I need more of that. I missed that actually a little bit. I, I, there was more of that in graduate school. Um, and so, one thing though, I will say is if we, if we think that we own the work, right, that it's just ours, that a lot of things can happen there. I mean, first of all, right, it is not true, but it can, it can stunt, you know, what we're able to do. We can get caught up too much in um, not wanting to share it out, um, that it has to be perfect. I've had lots of students come to me and say, Yes, but I feel the weight of feminist research on my shoulders. Like, I don't want to do something wrong. Okay. Well, partly that is what sharing your workout does for us, right? Is that people be like, hey, wait, right here, like, hey, you should check this piece right here. Why don't you think more about that? 
And that's why the process of writing itself too must be collaborative as we produce research, it must be collaborative. Um, yeah, I'm thankful to uh, Professor Russo for offering to read my work and then not being like, this is for shit. <laughs> you know, for just being like, great, you know, um, and I'm sure you could have, right, we could have gone on about it a lot more, but it's like, oh, this is, this is good. Like sometimes it just feels so um, meaningful that other people read your work and they're like, yeah, this makes like, yeah, you're making sense because we can feel so much like we're not sometimes. Um, okay. Does that hopefully answer some of this really beautiful question that I could spend so much more time thinking with you about? And I welcome you to, of course, come and talk to me more folks as well, if you would like one-on-one -on -one. Um, office hours uh, today, <laughs> uh, Tuesdays from three to five. Um, um, and because this question for me also is like a dot, 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 because it also depends in some ways, like where you are as a researcher, where you are in your journey. And I have so many ideas about collaborations that I want to do when places like DePaul give me more, you know, like time, maybe even like post tenure. Um, to do those things. Because so I think about in, in my life, like different projects and collaborations that I want to work on. And I have things that I'm excited about for the future. You know, that's another thing that I like to think about. And I hope you will too. Like, what will this researcher doing? Like, what what's next for you? You know? Um, thank you all so much. Anything else? I know we're probably, wait, what time does this end? Is it 2.30 that it ends? Oh, wonderful. I was thinking 2.10 or something. Um, it ends at 2.30, is that right? Yeah, yeah we go, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. good, good. Oh, good, I'm so glad. Yeah, so anyway, what is it? These are amazing questions, y'all. So um, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, Heather. First, <gasps> I just wanna thank you so much. It's just so great, like, um, even, I mean, for me, like, listening to you um, about your project and how you came into it, and your approach to interdisciplinarity, and the writing methods and research methods, it's just beautiful, you know, um, and I thought it was so great to end around this ideas around collaboration and um, yes. interconnectedness that I think are so, are so powerful, but people also often feel, you know, it's all on just me you know, and um, I mean, we're really encouraged to be isolated and we are just as individuals to compete with each other, to stand out among everyone else. And so I think that that there's another spirit there within that we hope to cultivate. Uh, don't always do it within women's and gender studies or feminist research. So, um, so I just so appreciate it. And yes, to everything you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. Yeah, I mean, you, I know you do this in your own writing, that kind of like thinking about maybe even anti-disciplinary methods and what it means to produce work that is really, you know, situated in um, broader conversations and like organizing and questions about justice. Um, and so, yes, like everything you just said, I think is so important to me because it doesn't always have to look like like there've been many times I've also been like, oh, I would love to collaborate on a project with another writer, right? I mean, you could literally think about it like that. Um, there's so many things, but I think I love what you just said. Um, and because, right, like even the work, like women of color, feminist uh, strategies and formations and theories offer us ways to understand that our work is, um, I don't know, that, right? That it's always in conversation with others, right? Like I, I think so often about Hill Collins when she wrote Black Feminist Thought and, you know, this, I come back to this so often where it's like, okay, when you're writing like the Bible on Black Feminist Thought, <laughs> right? Um, but she's saying too, you know, that, that the theorizing we do, even the theorizing around experience, right? Is always, always, in, within the the collective so that when hill collins was writing from back from his life, i'm not just like here's me pat hill collins writing about black women's lives from 
you know, but that she was writing it in conversation with other Black women, right? That there is like, I don't know, or what even like Gloria Ansaldúa calls La Facultad, right? That you're, you know, it's not just your own experience, but about the experiences of folks in your communities. So some of the things I've done, like when I think about collaboration, I'm also thinking about the places and spaces where I've like gone to learn from others. You know, like when I was going, you know, like when I was going to the Black Film Center and Archive at IU, like I was just thinking about that yesterday when I was at Indiana. And I would, I was like learning so much there. And I would have never had that if I had been somewhere where I was only doing like Chicana Latina feminism, which is what I had originally, you know, but I ended up going somewhere where I was really exposed to queer of color formations more broadly, um, Black queer sexuality and trans studies. So, so even that, I, I hope that makes sense to people, but like, just, yeah, and allowing yourself to, to go and think about and include in your work things that, that maybe you're like, well, how does that apply? How is that applicable? Or even back to like Liv's first question, what, you know, oh yeah, who should I be including, you know, in my work and in the ways that I think about this scholarship? So, ah, anyway. Yeah. Well, thank you thank again. You. Also, I love it. You're giving like all these prompts, you know, of like things to think about, right? You know, like each of the things that you bring in are things that I think everyone in the class can then take to their project. You know, I who, hope I, so. who, who am I in conversation with? Like, what am I trying to do? All those, all those questions. Mm. So, yes. And I hope it's helpful, you know, for ways in, um, you know, yeah. Is there, are there any other thoughts or comments or yeah and uh, otherwise otherwise I think question. what we can do is um thank Dr. Heather Montes Ireland maybe through the chat just to oh, a, a thank you or gratitude or you could you know do whatever you want to do to offer um thank you such gratitude. Um, oh I'm grateful to be able to talk about this thank you all this 